We want to welcome everyone to our Wednesday night service. We're glad that everyone is here. Uh, we have a few announcements before we get into our uh, devotional time together. Those that we know of that are sick, uh, Hubert uh, Panel, this Rita Panel's father-in-law is in the North Mississippi Medical Center. Uh, Tony Farr continues in the Tupelo Hospital also. Uh, Juan East Floyd's sister, Cuisine, uh, passed away. Uh, I believe she was about 93 years old, so we need to remember Miss Juan East uh, during this time. The weekly pantry item is saltine crackers. All of those that will be going to CYC need to meet in the TAC uh, following our class time tonight. It's everyone that's going to CYC this weekend, uh, please meet in the TAC. Golden Circle Breakfast is this coming Monday, and that will be at the Cracker Barrel. We'll leave from the building at 8.15. Our high school seniors are asked to go to the college class tonight. Uh, Casey Coston from the uh, University uh, Christian Center at Oxford will be uh, doing our devotional time together and he'll be talking to our college uh, class tonight. So all of those uh, that are seniors in high school need to be with the college class tonight. We're glad to announce that uh, beginning on March the 1st, Brother Stephen Hodgen will be working part-time with the church as, their, as our youth and education minister. Uh, he will be working with our young people and also uh, with our education program. Uh, Jordan Coates will continue helping in, the, in our youth program, program also. So we're glad to have Brother Stephen start that work with us beginning the 1st of March. That's all of the announcements that we have. Uh, John David's coming to lead our singing. Our invitation to song tonight is song number 907. Song number 907. After you get that mark, we'll sing song number 587, Sing and Be Happy. We'll sing the first and the third verse. Let us pray. 
the heavenly Lord, not and sing your, pra- sing your praise and allowing us to be able to worship you. Please let us think about the lesson that let us think about the lesson that we are about to be given. Bless everyone in Christ's name, Amen. Good evening, church. Good to be with you again. This is about the time of year that I'm with you every year now, seems like. Been, I think, four years in a row coming to be with you. And uh, really glad that Brandon uh, Hancock could come over with me tonight. Almost got Corey Rogers uh, to come with me, but he needed to stay in Oxford. And uh, so we've been super blessed to have them, them and super thankful to see Jordan tonight and Jeremy and Leanne and... Um, Already meeting, remembering some of the elders, Miss Beard, the Beard family, remembering Lisa. Good to see Miss Amy Lauderdale back there. I want y'all to know that we kind of opposed her moving back to Boonville, but, uh, you know, we just couldn't fight it. And I had to let her come back to you. So we will want her back in five years, so uh, just get ready for that. And, uh, but we're super excited, so thankful for how the body of Christ works and operates and how we're connected, even through the geography. Um, <clears throat> it's always, you know, Aaron's wearing the state stuff. I'm seeing the Bama stuff, you know. just seems to come out of the woodwork when the rebels come to town, you know. And I tell folks, of course, you may have heard me say before that I'm um, really a Razorback. I grew up in Arkansas and went to Fayetteville for undergrad. So it's all kind of allegiances here. And uh, Arkansas's time will come again. No, I don't know. probably not. Uh, but it's been fun. Uh, it's been a tough time for the rebels, but... Uh, uh, we're excited. Coach Luke's hanging in there, and uh, we'll see how things unfold. But Coach Harris, Maurice Harris, the tight end coach, uh, he's part of the River, Rivers Hill Church of Christ there in Oxford. And it's been good to get to know Coach Harris some, and it's a lot of neat connections there. So there's a verse that I, I thought of on the way over, and it's in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 15. And I, I, I mostly just want to share a few brief stories with you. And this is in a whole context, and I'm probably taking it out of context just a little bit, but I, I think the, the, the theme here, the heart of what Paul's trying to say, I think will benefit us tonight. When Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 15, all this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. So my job here in just a few minutes is I just want to let you know about the grace that has been overflowing and reaching more and more people, more and more students uh, with the campus ministry so that tonight you can give thanks for what God's doing in Oxford, Mississippi. We we sometimes, and maybe rightly so, there's some... uh, you know, we get a little scared of what the Ole Miss system is like, and uh, we're worried about the parties and the drinking, and I totally understand that, but there's a lot of good work going on in Oxford as well, a lot of good work going on in the campus ministry. So I just want to tell you a few stories tonight so that the grace that's reaching more and more people, you might know about that, and I hope it will cause you to give thanks tonight for the good work that God's doing there. So I mentioned uh, Coach Harris being at Rivers Hill. <clears throat> One of the really neat things that happened last year is when we went to Haiti, We've gone to Haiti for several years in a row now. I think this will be our eighth year. And Sherrod Bryant is the minister for the Rivers Hill Church. He went with our ministry last year to Haiti and loved it. And this year, our ministry with our church family has taken seven or so. And Sherrod has been able to recruit about another seven from the Rivers Hill Church and just some other students that come to Rivers Hill on Sunday, but they might be at uh, some other universities around uh, Upper Mississippi, North Mississippi. And so we're going to have about 15 students with Sherrod and I going to Haiti this summer. And I'm just super excited to see that partnership, seeing us work together in Oxford. Uh, is going to be a huge blessing to us. So I'm really excited about that. Another really neat thing is this year, our international ministry, uh, we're, we're starting to get some glimpses of how we could connect with international students on campus. Y'all know, you know, the world comes to the university, all right? I mean, you've got folks coming from everywhere around the world. Uh, you may know about, of course, the World Bible School and John Reese and that ministry, but the Friends Speak or Let's Start Talking ministry is another ministry that's from our brotherhood. Mark Woodward came to Oxford, got a graduate degree in, in English, and basically he and Sherry Lee were the ones that helped produce the Let's Start Talking material, and they came out of Oxford. And it's just been neat to see how we're using their material, connecting with international students whose 
English is a little bit rough around the edges sometimes, so we help them improve their conversational English, and we get to talk to them about the Bible, and they know it's the Bible, and, and we just get to have all these really neat conversations. Last year, we bef befriended a young lady, a graduate student from India in chemical engineering. And, you know, we didn't get to connect with her a whole lot last year, but this year, I just, in the fall semester, I said, hey, can we read the Gospel of Mark together? Let's just take a chapter a week. Let's just read the Gospel. And, you know, I'll just ask some questions. It'll help you understand, you know, our faith. This lady is not a Christian yet, but she's going to Haiti with us in May. She has maybe not, she's probably would consider herself a non-practicing Hindu, but, but she was in our home Sunday with some other students and church members, and, you know, we hadn't scared her off yet. You know, I scare some American students off, but I hadn't been able to scare the international students off yet. So it's been really neat to see her be attracted to what we're offering, and she's not there yet, but we're praying for her, and it's just really exciting. Her name's Yash, uh, for short, and... Um, so if you pray about things in Oxford, we'd love for you to pray for our international ministry. But even, uh, <clears throat> you know, with our freshmen, I, I loved our freshmen this year. We had a really good group of freshmen. One was just a, is a solid rock in our campus ministry. Her parents are big Auburn folks. Here we go again. And, um, but her, she was really determined to come to Oxford and Ole Miss to do special education. She wants to be a special education teacher. Ole Miss has a great program there. They gave her a lot of scholarships to come to Ole Miss. And her family came for about three years while she was growing up in high school, she came to the student center on weekends just to get to know the ministry, get to know the town, to feel good about letting her daughter <laughs> leave Alabama. Uh, sorry, we're talking about Auburn here. Um, leave Auburn and Alabama, you know, to come to Ole Miss and Oxford. And she's just been a rock in our ministry. She's just so solid. It's just great to see the faith that was cultivated in her parents through the Auburn campus ministry. And now it's being passed on, you know, in her life. But one really neat connection is that she got connected to her roommate. <clears throat> I think it was just a draw. I don't think she had any say in it. But she got her roommate to start coming to a Rebels for Christ in our campus ministry. Her name's Emma. And Emma, Emma's mom has had cancer for the last few years. She got to have a lot of time with her mom over Christmas. We got back in January, and she was telling us to pray for her mom because she'd had to go to the hospital because of some complications, some respiratory issues that's probably with her immune system being compromised. And, and we, before, it was, before we really knew what happened, she had died, and Emma had lost her mom. And, you know, so we just really tried to surround Emma, and it was so, such a blessing that Olivia was her roommate. And... Olivia's mom, when I was sending out an email uh, that maybe Jim and Estes here, maybe someone here gets this email that I send out, was just asking for prayers for Emma and her, her family as, as she'd lost her mom. Olivia's mom emailed me back saying, it was really comforting to Emma's mom, Tracy, to know that her daughter had found Christians and had found a place to practice her faith at Ole Miss, and that that gave her just such a tremendous amount of peace as she saw that the end was, was coming. And that, I'll tell you what, church, that is humbling. You know, these parents, you know, you, they drop their kids off, and they're pretty nervous, pretty scared, and tell you what, at a state school, I know it's getting more and more like that, but these parents, it, it's humbling to, be, to receive these students and for them then to realize that these parents are so grateful that there's something there for them. That's why I love our Christian schools, but I love our state schools because that's the importance of campus ministries is you want to be able to have folks there who are going to be there for your kids, but we're trying to reach the lost as well, right? We're trying to reach these international students. We're trying to reach lost American students. And I'm still trying to, I'm, you know, God's working on my heart. You know, when Jesus says uh, in Matthew 9, it says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. And I want to encourage you, keep working here in Boonville. The harvest is around us. The harvest is at Ole Miss. We're continuing to love the students that God brings our way. We're continuing to look for new students. These are just a few folks. Uh, we got another freshman guy that was baptized into Christ in the fall. He called me right before right around finals and he was like Casey I could you pay for like 
15 or 20 Bibles so I can start a Bible study in my fraternity. And I was just like, you know, that's one of the easiest things you can say yes to, you know, is when one of your students wants to start a Bible study in the fraternity and just needs some Bibles. I'm like, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll knock that out real fast. I'll get online, buy those Bibles, won't think another, you know, have a second thought about it. So there's just a lot of neat things going on. Please continue to pray for us. Uh, I, I do want to encourage you tonight, as Paul says here again, all this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more students, if I can put that in there tonight for you, may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. And I just want you to be encouraged tonight that God is at work in Ole Miss, and I hope that you can see clearly how God's at work in Boonville, Mississippi, and how he's at work in the Boonville Church of Christ, and for you to be paying attention to how God's trying to use you in this community and for the teens and for the students at Northeast, as we talk a little bit more here in a minute, for you to know that God's at work in Ole Miss. I want you to have confidence in coming to Ole Miss. Parents and friends of parents, you know, that are sending students to Ole Miss, or remember, get them to me, all right? Make sure they find me. Get on our website. Talk to Jeremy, Jordan, Leanne, somebody. And make sure you help us get connected to them because, again, I never talk this much, all right? But right now I'm just talking a lot. Remember, it really helps a ton to meet these folks before they ever get to Ole Miss, because if we wait till they get to Ole Miss, it's a little bit like Vegas, all right? I mean, it's just like all the lights and all the opportunities and all the clubs they can be in and all the responsibilities they have, it really helps us to build the relationship before they get to Ole Miss. So please help us do that. I hope something has encouraged you tonight. You know that the invitation always stands. If you're ready tonight to be baptized into Christ, if you want to make something right, you know these elders and ministers here are ready to pray for you. Won't you come while together we stand and sing? teachers go to class, we'll sing one verse of 860. 860, there is a habitation.
evening. Good evening. Good evening. Take just a moment and look at someone and say, I'm glad to see you, and smile. It is good. I hope not. Uh, it is very good to see you tonight, to be with you on this rainy uh, Wednesday, but the rain is uh, good for us. It'll help our... Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I hope to say more about this later, but uh, uh, I am... Lisa and I are very humbled and excited to be a part of the work here, and uh, I look forward to uh, getting to know you better uh, as time progresses, and hope you will make sure that I get to know you, uh, and I will, I will learn your name, and then I will proceed to forget it. Uh, well, that's not exactly true. I will remember all of them. I just won't call the right person with the right name. Uh, I do that on a daily basis, even at school. Um, tonight, as we look at some things, uh, before we begin, uh, I do ask you first to keep uh, Lisa and I in your, uh, keep Lisa and me in your prayers as we begin working with you. Um, that's important to me. But also, uh, on our prayer request tonight, before we begin our Bible class, I hope we'll continue to keep the uh, folks in Florida uh, who are continuing still, that will be a continual thing as they uh, go about uh, rebuilding their lives and recovering or adjusting to the uh, tragedy that they have suffered. And uh, one thing I'd like for us to think about, and you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's, I don't know, there's not a word for it. Sad doesn't really cover it, but we have reached a point that now, as a teacher, I'm a little more acute, a little more acutely in tune to it. But I noticed that to say, hey, you know, there was another school shooting today has almost become second place, run of the mill. You know, we're, uh, we are not surprised. I hope we're still saddened and shocked. Um, but Satan, uh, Satan is good at what he does, that when he finds something that works, he will do everything he can to exploit it. Um, keeping your prayers tonight, also, uh, I'll start our list. Tommy Walden, that's Pat Walden's uh, uh, husband and uh, her family. Many of you may not know Pat Walden, but uh, I worked with her, and uh, several of you worked with her. Um, it was several years ago, and uh, she had a battle with cancer, and uh, she has passed from this life. So remember her. Whom else do we need to put on our class list? We have a lot of course in our bulletin. Tuesday, Paula's got to have an ablation. Friday. Remember Paula, especially. Make a note. Remember Also Friday morning as she faces uh, some medical procedures. Yes, sir. Uh, family of Bill Oster Gant. He died today. Former sheriff of Oscar County. Good man. Remember the Gant family in our prayers? Would you bow with me, please? Gracious God, as we approach thee tonight, we are thankful for the opportunity to be alive, thankful for the opportunity to open your truth, thankful to be able to spill our hearts to you as we come before you. And as a group of people gathered for this class, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for our salvation, for your grace, for your goodness. And as we petition thee tonight, we especially ask that you would be with the Walden family, with the families in Florida, with Sister Paula as she goes through medical procedures on Friday, with the Gantt family and Father, there are so many more that are on so many hearts, those who are listed in our bulletins and those about whom we do not even know tonight, but you know. 
Help us, Lord, as we study together to do our very best to be your servants, to be students, to be servants, to be workers in your kingdom. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. Uh, I hope you've already got your Bible to Philippians chapter 4. We are using that as a staging uh, place, um, as an outline. As an outline of study, as we are digging into the Scripture and answering the question. We could answer it from different places. We could answer it in many ways from Scripture. But our goal is to let the Scripture uh, help us tonight to answer this question. How should a Christian behave? Uh, the world sees our behavior. Our behavior uh, earmarks us, demonstrates us as His servants. Uh, the Bible talks about, God talks about the behavior He wants from His children. And so we're just letting this passage help us answer that. How should a Christian behave? Well, we have already learned uh, from our study that if we are Christians, then from verse 1, we are steadfast or we are persistent. If we are Christians, uh, we love one another the way we are supposed to. If we behave the way Christians should, we are united the way Christians ought to be, in the Lord. And we overcome things that would split, split that unity or separate us from being united. And that's exactly what Paul was writing about in verse 1, 2, and 3. Therefore, my beloved and long for brethren, my joy and my crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Euodia and Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. I urge you also, true companion, Help these women who labored with me in the gospel and Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Now I'm going to read, keep reading um, every week from verse 1 up to where we are. We are at uh, number 4 tonight. If I behave the way a child of God ought to behave, then according to verse number 3, I am busy in my spiritual life. I am busy in my spiritual life. Well, what are your thoughts on the word busy? Before we uh, look at the scripture, before we talk about this verse, just think about the concept of busy. I'm not asking you to talk about being a Christian just yet. We'll do that in a minute. What does the word busy mean? Always doing something. Always doing something. Okay. But it does not mean productive. Hmm? But it does not mean productive. It does not necessarily mean to, to be productive. Okay. So, so then, uh, Jonathan, you are uh, suggesting, and I think rightly so, that there is a positive busy and there is a negative busy. What I mean by that is you can see people that work a lot and get nothing done. I see it all the time, literally. And so where I'm going with that is, is you can do a whole lot of work, but a laborer is paid to get something done, not be busy. You can be busy doing things that don't matter, like running your mouth and talking and doing all those other things, but if you're not getting the job done, you're just being busy. You're not being productive. So before, okay. So what, what are we talking? If we are talking about, I want somebody else to weigh in here, but I, I want to clarify uh, so what kind of busy do you think we're going to be talking about? If we are to be busy as Christians, you know, not busy bodies, uh, 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 are, are not just spinning our wheels busy. By the way, is Jonathan, is he just kind of making that up? Or have you ever been around people that seem to, to work all the time and never, you couldn't really tell what they got done? Kind of like... <laughs> no, you did not. Uh, but um, here, oh, so what kind of busy is the right kind of busy? The right kind of busy, busy that we're talking about here is being busy in the service of the Lord, and and our main purpose is to spread the gospel. And that, that would include living the right kind of life, you know. 
Mm -hmm. So a to go back to Jonathan's term, someone who is busy as a laborer, as a servant, we're laboring for the Lord, we're laboring in the kingdom, but that person, you see product of that person's labor. You see something being done. Tell me what the phrase means, busy as a beaver. First of all, have you ever heard that before? Okay. Well, I'm glad you said, I have learned that as a teacher, I, there are things that I use now that they, I, I can't use anymore because I have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, right. So what does busy as a beaver mean? I mean, you know, don't say, don't, don't say, well, it means you're busy like a beaver. That doesn't help me at all. Who? The beaver is? How? So a beaver goes about it how? Hard work, very industriously. How long does it take a beaver to uh, decimate an entire uh, uh, shoreline of a lake of all of its pine saplings? One season. Um, I remember a lake near where I used to live where that was cut off from uh, the road now. In fact, it, nobody really knew it was there. And uh, we'd go down and hunt around it sometimes. And uh, I, we said, I saw, oh, it looks like the beavers have been cutting. Uh, better check on them, they'll, they'll build a dam. You know, the next time I was down there, it was like, what are we gonna do to get rid of this dam? Because now the water was backing up. Uh, because they all, they're always what? What, how hard is it to get, all you have to do, right, is take a, a, a good solid broom and go down and, and just kind of knock that uh, dam down, right? Why are you laughing? Okay. Uh, uh, in fact, I asked a fellow one time, how do you get rid of beavers? He said, you can't. Uh, how do you get rid of beaver dam? Bulldozer? He said, dynamite. Yeah, okay, because there's a product of their work, and they are always, always. What do you do if, if uh, it was my granddaddy graduating? Uh, graduating, uh, exaggerating. Uh, it might, whoever said it, might not have been him. Um, that uh, if you were to take an axe and cut a hole in a beaver dam, that they would have it uh, stop back up by the time you got back home. Is that much? Is that an exaggeration? Not much of one. Because they're always doing something. And that's the whole point of this. And it's not just they're doing something you can see the results of. They're doing something with a purpose, with a focus, to accomplish a goal. And now we go back to what you said just a moment ago about being busy in the kingdom. Now this verse, and you say, well, how does this verse even talk about that? Notice what he said. Help these women. We just got through talking about their need for unity. We were just discussing whatever the problem was, we're not told, and I think that suggests that it wasn't worth to be discussed. But they needed to deal with it, and they did. But he said, help these women who labored with me in the gospel. You see, what was at stake there is the lack of unity would cause a rift in their work. It would cause a rift in what they were accomplishing for the Lord. They, they, if they couldn't work together, then they would stop working together. And that was important. That was very important. So the idea of labored with me. I'm sorry, did I interrupt somebody? It was probably still an old congregation too, you know, it could win. Well, sure. Sure, it could. And, and most likely was. But he said about them, they labored with me. I learned something. Here's what's interesting. Let's dig a little deeper here. I want to show you the definition that I got for the word labored. Now, if you, in our English language, if you read who labored with me, labored, you mentioned a laborer. Some, a laborer is simply a worker, someone who's doing something. Who's, uh, it, I want to, something interesting is that this verb doesn't mean that primarily. It means that, but that wasn't its primary meaning. When the Greeks used this word, they had something a little different in mind that was applied here. It blows my mind because the word literally, the Greek word, means to contend with someone 
on the same side. That is, to fight on his side, on the same side. Figuratively, it meant to labor together with someone or to aid someone, to work with them. I'm not sure I totally go along with that, that it was meant to be figurative, as in we work together. I'm not so sure it didn't mean exactly what the word meant, because the word meant we fight together. They were fellow workers, fellow laborers, but the word itself meant we're laboring together, not in building a house or not in, in, in doing this or doing that, but we are laboring as people who are fighting on the same side against a cause. Now, the reason why I think that that's the primary meaning is because of verses like, turn with me to 1 Timothy 6, 12. We must not forget, we must not forget that the Bible uses specific language in its commands, in its descriptions, in outlining for us what we are supposed to do, what we are not supposed to do. And so it's important when we get to 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul is writing to Timothy, but he is writing to us. That's why we have that there. When, Paul, when we hear what Paul says to Timothy, we need to be listening exactly the way Timothy was listening. And you are familiar with verse 10, the love of money is the root of all evil. But look at verse 11. But you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness. Pursue godliness. Pursue faith, love, patience, gentleness. He doesn't stop there. You do those things. You get rid of those. You stay away from the love of money. Should I? Yes. Just as Timothy. Should I pursue those things? Yes. But then he said, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life for which you were called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Lay hold on eternal life wasn't going to happen until. That was a description of what would happen after Timothy did what? This is the uh, cause for you. <coughs> Timothy was laid home hold on eternal life after he did what, according to that verse? Fight the good fight. Fight the good fight. Okay. Do you think the wor those words are incidental or accidental? No, absolutely not. Fight the good fight. Well, hold that thought. Go with me to 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Some of you can probably quote it, but let's all look at it together. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Now someone read that. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Um, I love to uh, use this verse, or, or this is a good verse to use when you are, even in the public school system, when you're, when you're teaching things in an English class, that uh, someone might say, well, you can't teach Bible in an English class. Sure you can. The Bible is listed as a uh, is listed in the Library of Congress. It's a piece of literature. And in that piece of literature is a great simile. So what do you use a simile for? Uh, or a metaphor? Basically, this is a metaphor. You take something everybody gets and then you compare it to something they don't get to help them get that, that something to make that point. Oh, okay. So do the two things have to be connected to make the point? Oh, absolutely. First of all, he said, be sober. Be vigilant, be clear-headed, think properly, and pay attention. Pay attention. Because, here's why, your adversary. Are words important? And we talk about, uh, uh, I talk to my students sometimes about diction, writer's diction. Why in the world did he say such a thing? You know, why did he use that word and not some other word? And I always use this illustration. And by the way, if I've told this story, one of you very kindly tell me that that I've already used this illustration in the same series, because I don't want to do that. But uh, I said to a, a group of teenagers, 
I said, yeah, are words important? And they said, well, okay, yeah, I guess. Uh, I want you to imagine you've got that certain someone, that certain someone, that you really have fallen into a really certain someone kind of relationship with. And you finally get up the courage and you say to him or her, I think I love you. What'd you say? I, I, I love you. And they say, oh, that's cool. I like you too. When you, oh, see, that was very mild compared to what some of the girls in my classroom do. You know, they kind of, <laughs> you know, but I said, well, it's the same thing. It's not. Well, sure it is. Like, look. Well, no, so the words are important then. Oh, yeah, say what you mean. Words carry meaning. Oh, so adversary is more than just an opponent. An opponent wants to score more points than I do. An opponent wants to beat me. An adversary wants to what? Destroy me. An adversary is an enemy. He doesn't have my best interest in heart. He has no desire for me to survive at all. Why? Because I am a liability to him. Why? I'm his enemy. He's mine. Adversary literally means enemy. What's interesting, this Greek word here, and I really don't want to get too far off track, but this word meant uh, opponent in a lawsuit. Someone who is trying to build a case against you. Isn't that kind of interesting when Jesus is called the... Uh, um, Sorry, 1 John 2, 1, that we have an advocate with the Father. You know why the King James says advocate? Because that was the name for a lawyer in uh, um, 1611, in that time. We have someone who is on our side, and we also have someone who is on the other side trying his very best to build a case against us. But now, tell me why you think. That's enough. I get that. Nod your head if you get that. We have an enemy who wants to destroy us. Could we stop right there? Yes. But So why, did, why, I want you to tell me why you think the Apostle Peter, through the Holy Spirit, through inspiration, goes on to say we have an adversary, the devil, identifies him, who walks about as a roaring lion walks about, seeking whom he may devour. What's the whole point of that? And please don't be like the student. And I say, okay, what's the point of the author? Make it sound better. You realize that, you realize that was not really an answer. Why do you think that he chose to do that? Be on guard. Okay. To be on guard. Now, who said that? Why does that reference make me want to be on guard? Why not a chihuahua? Why not a cat. Why not a poodle? You get the point? You couldn't help but grin because I've seen some ferocious chihuahuas in their head, but I've never been really afraid of them. Uh, okay. And he has the ability to do what? Divide. Divide. That's right. And I have a whole lesson, and I'm glad I don't have it up here because I'd probably want to start preaching it. But I have a, a lesson, I did some research, that a, a lion's jaws has several, I think it's 600 pounds of pressure in his jaws. He's made that way. That's why when he gets a hold of the gazelle, you always wondered why it goes down. Because it's done. Because when he clamps down, it's over. Okay, he wants to devour us. He's a lion. Okay, uh, if some of you said... If someone came running in and said, nobody go outside, there is a chihuahua loose in the parking lot. You're laughing because that's silly. You said there's a giraffe running loose. Most of us would run out there because we wanted to see one up close. But who in this room, if you knew that we lived in, if we lived in Overton Park in Memphis, or we had, let's say that they were transporting a lion through here, a lion had escaped, and had attacked three people already, one of them fatally, how many of you would run out with your camera trying to get a close-up picture of that line so you could see the blood dripping down its... Now, does that sound ridiculous to you? Okay, the Apostle Peter made it so very clear for us to understand this is a, an enemy to be afraid of. 
So when we fight the good fight of faith, now watch, let's take that and go to 2 Timothy, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, When we continue down, when we get to verse 4, I want you to notice in verse 3, he makes it quite clear. We walk in the flesh. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war against the Spirit. Okay, is there anyone who does not understand the, the arena of Christian living that Paul is referring to here? When he says war. When the word war is being used, do you know what's being talked about when someone says ball game? Let's play ball. What do you expect? Just talk to me. I'm going to a ball game. You want to go with me? What do you expect to see when you get there? Competition, ball game, players, some sport, right? Yes or no? Okay, when... You, someone says, I am going to war. What comes to mind? Fighting. What? Guns, shooting. Casualty. You get it. Okay, he said, our war is not according to the flesh. Verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, fleshly, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Absolutely. Not against flesh and blood. We have spiritual armor. Okay, so we get that part. Is there anyone, and I don't want to uh, um, tread on any sensitive ground, but if you're willing, is there anyone in here who has ever served in the armed forces? Okay. Now, any of you ever seen combat? Okay. Uh, do you know anybody who has? Okay. Now, uh, tell me, you didn't have to see combat necessarily. Tell me about the brotherhood that exists between soldiers. You've heard talk about it. Very strong. Very strong. Always there. Protect each other. Protect each other. Okay. Paul, when Paul said, who labored with me in the gospel, he was talking about more than just folks who showed up on Sunday. He was talking more, he, more about just folks who were Christians with him. These were people who had, I don't know what they did, I don't know what roles they played, but Paul said they labored with me. They literally, in the spiritual sense, fought with me against Satan. They worked side by side in this battle against the devil. We worked to build the kingdom and oppose the opposition. Questions or comments? He's stronger than that, though. Okay. I think he's stronger than the spiritual, especially when there's Paul. Beat with rods, shipwrecked, stoned. His friends that stayed by him, he had to have a bond with them because any normal person would leave. Why would you really hang out with a guy that dealt, was dealt that many blows? So I think when he says it, I think it's a very similar bond to the few, the lucky few that have that bond. <coughs> we don't experience that as much in America anymore. It's mostly emotional for us now, but I think there is a difference. I think there's a bond there that I think your analogy is really strong. I, I totally agree. And we must make sure we don't lose that strength because we have it. You know, it's interesting, Jonathan, I was going to, I like this line analogy so much. I said, oh, I, I think I'll use uh, where Paul said in Galatians that uh, he had uh, uh, fought with lions at Ephesus. I think it was Galatians uh, where he had fought. But if you read that text, if you really dig around in that text, he's not talking about Figurative. He actually is talking about as men fight. This, I said, well, I don't agree with you. And that's okay if you don't. But the suggestion there is Paul actually uh, was put in an arena at some point and had to battle a line. 
and he survived it. You do realize that Paul was a rough looking fellow. He had been beaten mercilessly. In fact, there was more than once he wasn't supposed to be alive. The only reason why they walked away from him when they stoned him is because they thought he had died. If, the, if, he had still, if they knew he was still breathing, they would have hit him again. Um, so Paul had lots of scars. And imagine if we had that situation today. I want you to imagine, uh, Billy Martin, may I ask you a question? I want you to imagine that uh, I, I'll use myself because I don't want to use anybody else in that uh, situation. Billy, I want you to uh, imagine that uh, we were in a situation working for the Lord, that people had been killed. I had been shot at. I'd been shot once, been shot at 10 times. Uh, every time I went out in the community, I'd been shot at. Car was all shot up, and I said, well, nobody will go with me, but I need somebody going out again today. Billy, you want to go? Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, and that's the, you realize that when folks agreed to be with Paul... They never knew what was going to happen. They didn't know what soldiers would show up or what would happen next. So I, I totally agree. And that's why it's important who labored with me that we have that kind of bond. We have a, a bond that is extremely close as we think the same way, the first same verse, and we work the same way, which is against the devil, which is striving to build up the kingdom so that it can withstand the attacks of the devil. Uh, and the reason why I think it's not just working together because he goes on down and talks about fellow workers. He goes on down to say, with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest, it also suggests here, it, it suggests that what... Uh, Jonathan, you said that not everybody there had that same close bond. Not everybody had been in the thick because he mentioned others as my fellow workers. Not that that was a bad thing, but a fellow worker is simply what? A co-worker. A co-worker. Tell me what a co-worker is. What? No, let me back up. I want you to very quickly, in a nutshell, tell me. Oh, my. Mm -hmm. It's not over yet. I'm almost there. Uh, I'm going to put you in charge of it. Oh, okay. Uh, Jonathan's going to be in charge of telling me when to stop. Now, um, what's a, give me your, uh, very quickly, an ideal fellow worker. Somebody that you you and he or you and she uh, got to work together on the same project and and accomplish it well, accomplish it fast, accomplish it productively. Give me some qualities you want in that fellow worker. Truthful. Dependable. Truthful. Good work ethic. Good work ethic. Timely. Timely. Hey, time out. What's a good work ethic? What does that mean? I agree with They pull their own weight. Pull their own weight. That's what, what does that mean? Okay. Uh, no. Uh, Ma'am? Timely? Uh, somebody else said something. Uh, what does that mean for the way? Uh, I know. Raise your hand if you've ever cut. This is going to be older folks. No offense. Because some of, you know. Anybody ever uh, cut with a crosscut saw? Okay. Uh, so tell do you know what it means when someone on the other end says, don't ride the saw? What's it mean? Yes. So in other words, did you know it's actually possible? I found out as a teenager, it is actually possible to actually move the saw and look like you're doing something. You just got to grunt every once in a while. But when you're really not, that's when granddaddy would say, boy, stop riding a saw. Yes. So are you suggesting that the person on the other end knows whether you're doing your part or not? Because you're connected. And that's the idea of a fellow worker. Uh, I really wasn't ready to stop, but I think it's time. I really appreciate your, uh, I want you, I'm going to give you a little bit of homework. I want you to, we might not get to it next week, but I want you to look at verse four 
And when you come back next week, I want you to have a perfect definition of happiness. What is the secret to happiness? That's your homework. Uh, to come up with that answer. So, thank you very much. Have a great night.